How many of you have ever been in an earthquake before? If you have, would you raise your hand? Yeah, a bunch of you guys have. Several years ago, I was in Indonesia and suddenly I felt the earth move under my feet. I felt the sky tumbling down and tumbling down. Well, maybe not the second part, but I definitely felt the earth move under my feet. I was so shocked because I'd never been in an earthquake before. And those of you who've experienced it, you know what it's like. It changes everything, doesn't it? An earthquake changes the status quo. It reverses the circumstances you're in. You think you're on solid, stable ground, but uh, suddenly everything is shaking. But as I went through that earthquake experience, and I have to say it did not last very long, but even in the midst of it, not one time did the thought occur to me that this earthquake could lead to someone's freedom Or this earthquake could lead to my freedom. There was not one time I thought of that. But yet that is so true to scripture. Because we know that God can use an earthquake. We know that God can use a storm. We know God can use anything to bring his people into freedom. We know that God can use anything to bring the lost into a found relationship with him. And as we dive back into Acts chapter 16, where we were last week as we began this passage, we are going to see how the Lord can use an earthquake. And the reality is when you experience an earthquake, then many times smaller quakes continue to happen. We call those aftershocks. This passage of scripture is so full of God's power, it's so full of God's love that as we continue to read it 2,000 years later after this instance, the aftershocks of God's truth and God's grace keep on coming. That's my prayer for you. My prayer for me today is that we would put our trust in what God is bringing to us today because it truly leads us to freedom, his freedom. And what did we know He who the Son sets free is free indeed. So we pick up the scripture where we left off last week. We find ourselves in the town of Philippi. Paul and Silas, they're on a missionary journey. And as they've been going and they've been sharing the gospel, suddenly a demonically oppressed lady, young girl, starts to follow them. She was known in the town as a fortune teller. And so she was following them, harassing them. And Paul knew that it was evil that was influencing her. And so Paul, in the name of Jesus, cast that demon out of her. And so she was set free, dramatically set free. Well, her slave masters, they were angry because their source of income, her fortune telling, was now taken away from them. And so they grabbed Paul and Silas and they dragged them out in the public square. And that's where we pick up today in Acts 16 verse 22. The crowd rose up together against them and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. I want you to make sure you grab a hold of the cruelty of what's just taken place. These men who are seeking to do the right thing for God, seeking to give the love of Jesus away, they've upset the community, they've upset the culture, and so they're tortured for it. They're they're beaten, they're bloodied, they're bruised. And if that was not enough, the magistrates then turn them over to a jailer And the jailer begins to enact his own punishment. First of all, he places them in maximum security. He takes these two men and he puts them in the inner prison. There there was no light, no running water. You can just imagine the horrific conditions that they were in. He puts them in maximum security. But he also wants to inflict maximum pain upon them. So he puts their feet in stocks, not the stocks that you see at a photo op at an amusement park. No, it's nothing like that. There were stocks that were your your ankles were spread so far apart, it could even dislocate your hips. Maximum security with maximum pain. That's the situation 
that Paul and Silas found themselves in. But we go to this next verse that truly to me is one of the most shocking verses in the Bible. Let me remind you of it for those of you who were here last week. But about midnight, will you say midnight? Say midnight. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God and the prisoners were listening to them. The first aftershock in this passage is that Paul and Silas were praising God at midnight. In this dark and horrible prison, Paul and Silas, they chose to praise God. This so flies in the face of the way most everyone lives. Our natural inclination when we're going through suffering, when we're going through hard times, is to complain or to blame to complain or to blame God. God, how could you do such a thing to me? We've given our lives away. We're on this trip for you. We're risking our lives, our families for you, our incomes for you, and you put us in prison? How could you, God? I would say that would be a natural reaction for most of us. If you're at one of the worst moments in all of your life, does your heart go to praise? Does your heart go to praise? Why? What what was it that Paul and Silas experienced? What was it that they knew? They knew that their God was so good, that their God was so great, that he was with them even in the prison. They were able to praise God because, first of all, they had a firm belief, a firm trust in who he was. They could have easily said to you and to me today, we trust our good, good father, But also, too, they realized that the only one who had the capacity and the ability to deliver them from the situation was God himself. They were out of bullets. There was nothing that they could do on their own. So in the lack of total resources, they realized there's only one that has an answer to our problem. And so they began to praise and they began to worship God. They wanted to remind themselves that God was with them, even in the midst of all that they were experiencing. And I want you to take note of something. Paul and Silas were together. They were praising together. It's just a reminder, y'all, in all of life, we need brothers and sisters that stand beside us. Because when one of us doesn't want to yield to God, we'll have a brother or a sister, a friend who will be there, who can say, hey, let's go to the Lord together. I don't want to go to the Lord. Let's go to the Lord together. And then you begin to enter into prayer and praise and your heart begins to lift away from self-pity into realizing how great our king is. We need one another. None of us are created to walk through this life as an individual trying to make it on our own. We need one another. They were there for one another and they lifted their hearts toward the Lord. Such a powerful truth. They praised him in anything and everything because they knew who he was and they knew about his power. But did you also catch that last phrase? said, as they were singing, as they were praising God, the other prisoners were listening intently. I imagine for the other prisoners that had been in this prison, there wasn't a lot of praising going on. There's probably a lot of cursing, a lot of screaming, but yet now they heard this praising going on. They listened intently. What's taken place is their worship, Paul and Silas, their worship became a witness of God's goodness and God's grace. When we worship, it is a witness. When we sing together, when we cry out together, Lord, send revival, it's a witness to everyone who's here. We're depending on the Lord. Their worship was a witness. A friend reminded me this week about the story of two girls. They were from a church in Waco. Their names were Heather Mercer and Dana Curry. Heather and Dana were called by God to go serve in Afghanistan as missionaries. And they showed up in early 2001 and they began to build relationships and they began to share the gospel. Well, the Taliban wasn't going to have any of that and so they were arrested. These two girls were put in prison in Afghanistan. And then 9-11 happened and it complicated the release efforts and these two young ladies, they were part of a team of six women who were ministering there some men who were on the guy's side that were part of this effort. But Heather and Dana and their team, they just made it a purpose 
that every day that they were going to pray and they were gonna praise God, they were gonna worship, they were gonna sing songs to God. And so that's what they did. They would just cry out to God from their prison cell. Sometimes they would have the opportunity to go outside in the courtyard in the afternoon and be with the other prisoners. And it was so interesting, my friend said, that they would go out into the courtyard and these Afghan ladies, many of them imprisoned unjustly by the Taliban too, would come up to them and through translators, they would say, when we heard you singing, we felt peace. When we heard you singing, we felt peace. And they were able in the prison to share the God of peace. They were able to share in the prison the love of Christ. But if that wasn't enough to the story, sometimes when they were in the courtyard, they could hear screams and yells coming from the men's side. It was on the other side of the wall in the men's part of the prison. And they would hear men yelling and they weren't sure if it was some of their friends being tortured or not. And so these ladies, they would go to the wall of the prison and they would put their hands on it and they would begin to sing out. They could hear the men's prison calm down. Those screaming voices went away. It's just the power of God in action. Worship is a witness. Your worship is a witness. You may bring friends along and they may sing to you, man, you're pretty enthusiastic. You, you sing out to God, why do you do that? You're not impressing anyone just because you trust him, you believe in him. So that's how the story gets going. And then suddenly, verse 26, there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. Verse 27, when the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. You need to understand in that honor, shame culture, if you failed at that job, his job was to represent Rome, to keep the prison secure. There was only one punishment for that failure and that was death. So the jailer was like, I'm, I'm not gonna allow myself to be punished by anyone else. I'm gonna take my own life. But listen to this, verse 28. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself for we are all here. The second aftershock is that the prisoner stayed. What did Paul cry out? He cried out, we are all here. They were singing, they were praising God at midnight in their darkest hour. But in the midst of the cruelty that they had experienced, they returned it with kindness. It would have been so easy to say, the doors are open, the chains are gone. Lord, thanks for the way out. We are running for it but they stayed. Why would they stay? I imagine they stayed, first of all, because they believed what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, you have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Paul wrote this himself in Romans 12, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with God. good. Not only did they praise, they stayed. Why? Because they realized that God had a bigger purpose for them than just protecting their lives. They knew that to live as Christ was, and to die is gain. They knew that. They knew that even if they lost their lives in this prison, that their forever was covered. God had them. They knew it. So it allowed them to live in that moment and to seek to bless someone who would persecute them. And I thought, as I read this, it's such an aftershock because it is so, so opposite of our culture today. So opposite of our culture today. That if someone criticizes us, we want to criticize them back. If someone disagrees with us, we wanna disagree with them back. See, the reality is the body of Christ, we are not meant to use the world's tools. We are not meant to reach the world 
the same way that the world seeks to, by influence, by popularity, by fame. No, we impact the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul and Silas, they were willing to put their lives at risk because they said something bigger is at play. So as you sit in an office next to someone that you don't like very much, or you have a friend or you have a neighbor that, man, you can't, honestly, you can't stand that person, a teammate. Realize the story's not done, the story's not over. God may use you. He may use you, he may have you to have a part, even in this dark prison. Paul and Silas, they knew, man, they trusted. They knew that God would have a part for them. And so what happens, what takes place? Verse 29, and he called for lights and rushed in, trembling with fear. He fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. The third aftershock that we can't ever get over is the life-changing power of the gospel the life-changing power of the good news. What did this earthquake do? It caused this strong, confident, cruel soldier to a breaking point where he runs in. And just in an instant, everything had changed. He had gone from being the keeper of the keys to suddenly he's on his knees before them. And he asks the most important question that all of us need to ask. He said, what must I do to be saved? You know, the jailer may have just been asking the question, how do I get out of here? How do I get out of this mess? But the thing that Paul and Silas did is they went after his deepest need. They went after his most important need. They went to the heart of his problem. The heart of his problem is he didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And for any of us, as we are born in this world, we are sinners. And we can be and stay slaves to sin unless we have a breaking and earthquake in our life unless we come to the place of surrendering to him. And, and Paul and Silas, they just kept it so simple. What must we do? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul writes in Romans 10, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's simple, my brothers and my sisters. Our salvation comes through Jesus and Jesus alone. Our salvation is Jesus Christ plus nothing else. It is a complete gift of grace. That jailer who seemed so strong and so in control, suddenly he reaches the point after this earthquake of breaking and humility and he knew he needed help. And Paul and Silas, they gave him exactly what he needed. And they said, this is how you are saved. And, and then we pick up the story in verse 33. And he, the jailer, took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. He realized that's what he needed and he came to Christ. And I wanna make sure you understand this. When it says with his whole household, it doesn't mean that he asked Jesus in his life. So therefore, his whole household naturally comes. No, it says that they shared the word of God with each one of them and they all believed. Everyone in his household came to know Christ. And what did they do? They were baptized immediately, immediately. I can't tell you how radical it was for this jailer, this Roman jailer to say, I'm switching allegiances. Immediately he realized what he needed and he said, I'm on God's team and he got baptized and he demonstrated such care and such compassion. The man who put him in those painful stocks is now tending to their wounds. You see the pattern. He comes to know Christ and then he has a story to tell and immediately he goes home and he tells his family and that's how we impact our families. We come to know Jesus we begin to live out the good news and our families begin to see. Now, this jailer, he got a gift that it happened immediately for him. Some of you are hanging in there, you're contending for your family and you have been for a long time, but he got this gift 
that God gave it to them that immediately they began to get it. Often I'll talk to folks and they'll say, I wanna be the best dad or I wanna be the best mom I can be or the best friend I can be. How do I do that? You love Jesus with your whole heart. You love him with your whole heart. And that's the most important thing. You love Jesus with your whole heart. You receive his love and they're gonna begin to see the overflow. They're begin to see, I want what you have. The reality of this amazing earthquake story is this. That we look at the story and we look at Paul and Silas and we say, you know, Paul and Silas were the ones who were imprisoned. The reality is no, they weren't in prison. They were free. They were free in Jesus Christ. They were free because they were free in him. It allowed them to love. It allowed them to serve. It allowed them to stay. You see this dramatic impact. They were free. And the jailer, the jailer was the one who was in prison, but he found that freedom in Jesus Christ. Some of you would say today that your life seems like you're stuck. Could be even stuck in a prison, stuck in confinement. I can't get out of this situation. I wish things would change. Things are so much harder than I want them to be. You feel so stuck. The answer is always gonna be in Jesus. He is the one that gives freedom. In a few moments, some of you are gonna need to experience that freedom today and say, Jesus, I wanna believe on you just like that soldier did. I wanna believe on you and I wanna experience forever life in you. For some of you, that needs to be your prayer today. But I also know there are many of you who are Christians today, you're part of God's family and you know that for sure. And what I wanna remind you of today is God can use you in ways that you would never even imagine. God can use you. He can help you be part of someone else's story and blow you away with his goodness even when you don't want to. Many, many years ago, when Tanya and I were buying our first house, we were very excited. And we had put an offer, contract, the option period, 30 day option period had started. And we were talking to a lady who went to second who was living down at the end of the street. And she was telling us about the neighborhood and all that. And she said, oh, by the way, I think you're gonna know the people that live right across the street from you guys. You may remember, and she said a name, this young man, when he was in high school, he went to second. You may remember them and remember this family and probably five years had gone by. And when she said that, I thought, oh, I remember that family. I really remember the dad of that family. That young man started coming second semester of his senior year and decided to join our church. And when he told his parents about it, his dad just went crazy with anger. He and his son had been having a lot of issues and so he really probably in his coping mechanism decided the church was a good place to take out his anger. And so I had been out of town and I got a phone call from a lady I worked with and she said, Dave, you got the angriest phone call today that I think you've ever gotten before. And I said, what was going on? And she told me the story. Well, as soon as I got back in, I called him and man, he was, he was super, super angry. And then he followed that phone call with, he tried to go up the chain of command as far as he could about who we were as a church. He wrote letters. He was really, really an angry guy. I definitely remembered him. And so when she said, this is who lives, gonna live across the street with you guys, I thought I'm breaking this contract. I don't wanna live here. And uh, Tanya and I talked about it and we prayed about it and in her wisdom, she said, Dave, the Lord may have something for us in this story. And I was like, okay, we're, we'll, we'll go for it. And so we bought the house and the day we moved in, we were unloading a truck and his wife, who was super friendly, came across the street and we began to visit. And a few minutes later, he came across the street and he began to talk and I could tell he was super reserved. Well, I just wanted to get it out of the way right away. And so I said, hey, I, I know who you guys are. And they said, well, how do you know us? And I said, well, I knew your son when he was in high school. I said, I was the youth pastor at Second Baptist. And he goes, I remember you. And I said, I remember you too. 
And so that became the walking on eggshells dance. She was so friendly, she'd come over but while we were out in the yard, but he was super reserved. And wouldn't you know it, after we had been there about a year, she went to a women's event at our West Campus, and like we do, we follow up. And so they got a note from the church thanking her for coming, and when he saw the mail on the church letterhead, it started the whole thing all over again. More phone calls, more letters, and I was like, why do we live here now? Really, really, I thought that. And so another year goes by and we continue to do the walking on eggshells thing, you know. And after we had gone through about another year, Tanya by now is the block captain of our street and she got a phone call that our neighbor's wife had been killed in a car accident. And so I called him and I said, hey, I heard, I'm so sorry, could I come over and see you? And he said, no, no, you can't, but I appreciate you calling. And so we went to the funeral that week and as we were walking out through the receiving line, I could tell when we came through the line, he didn't recognize us at first. And then suddenly it was like, oh, okay, I know who you are. And he thanked us for coming. And uh, a couple more days go by and there's a lot of, people coming and going from their house. And one day I was mowing my lawn. I was going back and forth and I had my headphones on. And suddenly as I turned around this way, I sensed a presence there and I looked up and it was my neighbor. And I I, I took my headphones off and I stepped up and I said, man, I'm so, so sorry. And without saying a word, he just wrapped, he just wrapped his arms around me and he began to weep. And he just held me for like a, he just held me for like a minute. And he just said, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. And that was a breaking for us. And a friendship began to form. And we began to know each other. And I began to see the bigger picture about him and and who he was. And he showed my son kindness. And we became friends. One Saturday, I was walking down the street and he drove by and he stopped and rolled his window down. He said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm preaching tomorrow and I, uh, I'm just going over my message in my head. And he was like, oh, okay, that's good, that's good. So I went and I stood up the next, that Sunday and the scripture that day was 1 Corinthians 13. We know it as the love chapter. And I'm preaching on the love of Christ, the love that we can have in him for one another. And I walked to this side of the stage and I noticed on the second to last row was my neighbor. Even when we don't want to, God uses his people to love other people so they become his people. Even in and through an earthquake, God can set people free and he gives us the privilege. Selfish people like me, he gives us the privilege of being part of it. He or she who the son sets free is free indeed. Indeed. 